Okay, for the second half of this lecture, we're going to start off with the humanistic therapies, um, which is uh, more, um, it came out more later than the psychodynamic Freudian. Uh, they were developed in the 40s and 50s, but they became popular mostly in the 1960s uh, based on the ideas of uh, humanistic existential philosophies, uh, the work of Carl Rogers and um, Abraham Maslow. We saw at Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs in the uh, chapter about motivation, and this is uh, very much connected to the therapies that Carl Rogers developed in his client-centered therapy. Um, the, here the focus is not on the subconscious and uh, repressed uh, feelings and shame and uh, those um, uh, unwanted uh, emotions that were uh, uh, deep down buried inside according to the psychodynamic uh, uh, perspective, but rather on the subjective conscious experience, what person is thinking and feeling right now. As I said, it's based on the works of Carl Rogers, see him on the left. Abraham Maslow, we see him on the right. Um, Maslow was the, uh, was the theoretical master and Rogers was the clinical master. Um, and the basic idea is that, of course, you give it the proper conditions, one can grow in more positive ways, right? A focus, and that's, it's, it's when it, in clinical work, it's focused on the here and now. Because of the here and now, you're looking towards the future. Don't dig into the past, but look towards the future where you want to get to, okay? Um, it, if And if you remove those blocks, you will get to that ideal of self-actualization, uh, some reason or another, there is something stopping you from uh, going into that place where you want to be, and it might be that you're lacking in the physiological needs, uh, or they, uh, or if that is satisfied, then the safety and security. But somehow or another, something is blocking blocking you to get to where every single human being, according to the humanistic theories and the humanistic therapies, every single human being wants to. Uh, self-actualize and be full of vitality, creativity, self-sufficiency, authenticity, playfulness, and some sort of meaningfulness. Uh, so here we're looking not at the past, but rather at the future as a cause for uh, behavior and a cause for uh, uh, psychopathological behavior, logical behavior. What is it based on here? It's based on the idea when you get into a client-centered therapist, it's based on the, the intention that people to, the, uh, was going to get in touch with their genuine feelings and actually pursue their own interests uh, as they are, uh, 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 and, and without thinking of the way other people. In other words, many, many, many of us will want to do things because of some sort of social pressure or because feeling of, of insufficiency. Uh, but we don't need to adopt the thoughts and feelings of others. We have to recognize pressure and where it comes from and get down into um, the real feelings of what it actually is, what you really, really want to do. And that's because we do have the ability to make free choice. Okay, It's a basic idea of humanistic philosophy. It's the concept of free choice. We are free to do what we want. It's not that we're forced to behave in a particular way because of inner uh, uh, inner strives, inner drives, inner uh, anxieties, according to, as is uh, thought of in the Freudian school. We don't, uh, we have free choice and not forced because of environmental factors, as in the behavioral school. That's why this is actually called the third force in psychology. The first being, of course, the Freudian, the second being the behavioralist where the Freudian says we're forced to behave in a certain way because of inner uh, rumblings. Uh, the second force behavioralist is that we're forced to behave in a certain way because of um, external environmental factors. And the third force being the humanistic and the client-centered therapy based on the humanistic is that we're not forced at all. We're actually uh, allowed to have free choice. And with that free choice, of course, you can, if given the proper um, nourishment of the proper freedom that you're always going to get to that self-actualization. What happens when you can't get? You get roadblocks. They say there's roadblocks in the path of self-actualization. Something is stopping you, some sort of fears that you're going to have to make a decision to do something in a way that you really don't need to do it. You, it's, it's not that um, 
I mean, people do self-sabotage. Why do people do things that don't that, that don't seem to be the right the right way of doing? It? Because they're making the decisions which seems to be best for them at that particular time. They are looking for the best choice around. They might be doing something which is uh, completely uh, unacceptable in society or even to themselves. But at the time that they're making the choice, they they real they realize or think they realize that this is the best way of making a, uh, a getting towards that uh, being a good person um, okay it's the need to get around certain sort of difficulties in order to get to now sometimes when you start down the wrong path it starts getting worse and worse and worse and that's why people wind up going to uh, to psychotherapy uh, but in the if with the client said with the client said to therapy which is non-directive as does the what you have to do but it helps the person feel as a whole achieve that it's it's not a matter of uh, I think this is the best way to go. It's looking into yourself and 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 exploring what you need in order to feel as a as a um, a complete person. The idea here is that it's not directive. I can't tell you as a therapist what you want to do. You know best what is best for you. You know best was if I accept your feelings and accept the directions that you want that you that you, and your perspective, then you're going to and I allow you to explore the way you're feeling and what you feel is your real self. Then you'll be able to get there. I mean, you've always had these experiences. If you have an experience where you and a, and a loved one are having a fight and you say something and then he or she says to you, oh, that's what you really feel? Yeah, no, I'm just saying because I'm angry. I'm, that's not my real feelings. My real feelings, I'm a nice, sweet, love, loving guy. Uh, but no, that's what you have to get to that, what you feel is the um, um, the. Uh, uh, f- uh, real feelings underneath. In order to do that, the therapist has to first uh, express unconditional positive regard, regardless of your behavior, regardless of how you act, regardless of your situation. Positive regard. I consider you a worthy person, an absolutely worthy person. Unconditional positive doesn't mean that I accept your behavior. doesn't mean that I think that you're doing things right. But it does mean that I believe in you as a person that even if you've made mistakes and gone down the wrong place, if I can understand where you're coming from, I will see how you're really doing doing what's the best for yourself. Okay, in other words, I accept the validity of your perceptions and the validity of your emotions. It's not that you shouldn't feel that way. Of course I understand. If I were in your position, I would feel that way also. Not that I can ever actually 100% be, but that is important because with that you come up with an empathetic understanding. Empathy. Empathy means that you're able to put yourself into somebody else's position, that you're able to um, reflect accurately the other person's perception. Not my perception of what's going on, not my experience of what's, what, what would, it, it, how I would feel if I were in your shoes, but if I were actually in your shoes with your experience, I can undersee and see how you've come to that particular idea and feelings. That's empathic understanding. Extremely important, those th- two, th- two things. And the third thing, of course, is genuineness. One has to be genuine. You can't actually do it from, well, okay, I understand. Yeah, I understand, I understand. Now, that was not going to work. It has to be uh, that you recognize also that your own feelings can come into that, right? And sometimes when you're in, when you when you're talking to somebody else, he says, "You know, I understand. I, I happen to feel this way, but you feel that way, and I understand. You know, if I were in your shoes, maybe I'd feel this. Uh, 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 I, this, if I were in your situation." This is the way I feel. I'm getting this feeling from you that's genuine. But you, I understand you. You know, separating the two and being genuine, owning your own feelings and and not projecting them on somebody else, but actually being empathic and understanding with an unconditional positive regard. These are the factors which are absolutely essential to the success of the humanistic therapies. This is client-centered therapy, as you say at the top. Um, uh, of this slide. Client-centered therapy is the uh, Rogerian therapy, uh, which is based on humanistic uh, uh, humanistic principles. Another type of humanistic um, therapy is, well, it, it's actually within this field, is the Gestalt therapy. Uh, we've mentioned Gestalt in the past. The word Gestalt is a German word, which means a uh, whole or uh, complete. Uh, and the idea this was uh, originated by uh, Franz per- uh, Fritz Perls in Germany, 
Uh, and the idea was that people, in somehow or another, disown parts of themselves and they don social masks. They put on stuff. They put on a face. Um, and this and 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 actually, it's not a complete um, a complete picture of themselves. There's a conflicting pictures of themselves. There's different parts of their personality which is not quite right, and it's it's like a puzzle which is uh, not right, uh, not 100. It and it, it it you disown parts of this pieces. There's pieces missing from the puzzle, so to speak, and it leaves gaps in your personality. Right? And the goal then is to fill those gaps. And the, and the therapist's uh, goal is to help the, thi- the, the client take responsibility. Now, in truth, this is really something which is true for all therapies. A person, if he takes responsibilities for his actions and the consequences, uh, then with the, the growing responsibility for, the, for his own behaviors and thoughts, then it's, that's a major a component of all therapies. Just like as we saw in the previous slide that uh, the idea of genuineness and unconditional uh, acceptance is probably a basic idea to, for the success of any type of therapy. But here we're talking about that there are certain gaps which for some reason or another um, uh, they, it, you, 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 it makes a conflict because you haven't uh, actually um, uh, fulfilled those things which you haven't been able to to uh, conject or uh, uh, connect so for I'll give you an example so let's for instance there's you have feelings emotions for you for your for your father and your father passes away because generally speaking parents pass away before their children so the adult child is no longer able to express his feelings uh, towards or anger or love or something missing in that whole uh, picture of relationship between, and so there's a gap in the relationship between the child, the adult child, and the, and the and the father, or the adult child and the mother. It's missing, and so that is a gap in in his, in, in the, the client's emotional expressiveness. Okay, and the idea is the therapist will direct uh, the client uh, to um, do some exercises in order to fill that need. Okay, and there's all different types of exercises. For instance, there's the idea of dialogue, right? Where you, which is somewhat like role play. I will be your father. You'll be you, and you'll we'll, and we'll discuss this, right? We'll have a discussion. You be able to express your feelings, right? The as long and and uh, and over and over, and repeating and, ex, and 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 emphasizing that the client will take responsibility. Another type, or uh, uh, for instance, one can. Play a projection. What does it mean by play a projection in Gestalt therapy? Uh, in play a projection in Gestalt therapy. So the idea in um, in playing the projection, a projection. This is uh, goes back to uh, the psychodynamic Freudian idea that my uh, uh, my behaviors, which I, I which I am denying in this case. Through this person, is, um, I don't recognize exist. I'm giving them on somebody else. I'm saying somebody else is acting that way. Uh, and the idea to play the projection is to act out the behavior which I think somebody else has, even though it's really my own feelings. I believe that he is acting that way. I see him be acting that way. I, th- I, I, and really the reason why I see it is because I am feeling that way. So the therapist goes and says, okay, I want you to play the part of the other person. And once the person plays that part and, and within the safety of a therapeutic uh, uh, situation, and he doesn't get punished for being that way, he begins to be able to accept it within himself. That would be the idea that in, in the Gestalt therapy playing protection. You see that there's there is this is another um, type of uh, therapy. The Gestalt is is not quite as popular as it you used to be, uh, but there are still, especially since for those people who are living in New York City. Uh, as my students are, we find that a lot, there's still a lot of Gestalt therapists. There's humanistic therapists. These people are still uh, quite um, available within the big cities. Uh, not so much, but again, most therapists can might use some of these uh, particular um, pieces, and they'll become. Ecl- Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about behavior therapy. Uh, this is the therapy which is based on behavioral principles, the uh, principles that we learned in the chapter about uh, learning, uh, the particular classical conditioning, and um, uh, 
uh, operant conditioning. And we see here, of course, we remember old little Albert, uh, who was um, trained by uh, Professor Watson to be afraid of uh, a white mouse or afraid of anything big and furry. Uh, and that was the idea of a conditioned fear. Of course, you can uncondition the fear also by the same way. We find many phobias were actually uh, possibly um, uh, brought about by, uh, by simple classical conditioning. So these uh, applies the pr principles of learning directly to change the behavioral, to change behaviors. The per and and uh, these are action therapy, a therapy which is an, an observable behavior. It's also, by the way, called behavior modification. Here, insight is not needed. No need for that. Nothing talking about that. Fear reduction. We can use this for, for phobias and to reduce the idea of fear. Um, how does that happen? What is? What are we talking about? You can have this idea of systemic desensitization if one has a phobia, an arachnophobia of, of, of spiders. I do hope that nobody watching this is arachnophobic. Uh, and if you are, close your eyes and just listen for a few minutes. But the idea here is that you make a fear hierarchy. Uh, something you, uh, the idea that you make uh, a, a something which is less um, fear provoking and less fear provoking and less fear provoking different le levels of of um, of, uh, uh, of fear different levels of, of anxiety so one might not be able to touch a spider but you can look at it from uh, uh, but looking at it from uh, from afar might not be so bad but looking at it from close might be a little bit worse and getting right up or looking at it uh, from as a picture would be uh, would be okay. Or looking at it as a line drawing might be okay. So let's say the best you can do is to look at a line drawing and to look at actual picture like we have on the screen here would be anxiety provoking. So then you first have to try to get you lower your anxiety when you look at a line drawing. And then you can look at when that's okay and you feel fine. There's no problem with that. Great, wonderful. Then you go to the next one and you see a picture. And then further you can and slowly 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 um uh uh, uh get to a, a higher level um this these are the ways that one one has to do it you can slowly uh increase more disturbing symptoms while the out uh, what can be counter conditioned and the counter conditioning of course that would be uh conditioning while you're looking at something um uh, that is slightly anxiety provoking. You do something wonderful. You have something nice. You smell a good uh, smell if that's what you like, or or eat eat a, eat a, a, a candy. But it's called a, uh, make a response which is incompatible with the anxiety. Okay, and then you can fear, and then you slowly uh, perceive yourself as less and less fear through and fearful until you're actually safe. Of course, it can also uh, we use as we saw in Bandura's. Uh, experiments uh, where he showed about aggression. Albert Bandura showed these uh, that aggression can be uh, can be learned by modeling. Also, the lack of fear, the uh, the ability to be in in in, in the in a, uh, in a situation uh, which is a phobic situation can be learned through modeling. Also, and these are actually Bandura's pictures of modeling. Uh, I, the a lack of fear to a snake, people who were, uh, uh, had a, a snake phobias, and uh, that was called vicarious desensitization. You desensitize vicarious. Vicariously means by watching. Uh, in other words, you, in some way or another, this is uh, done only within the brain. It's still called behavioral therapy because that's basically... Um, uh, what what we're talking about that is a, a, on a behavioral level. So let's uh, we can see the other level is of course aversive conditioning. This is um, uh, this is you can find this lady on, on on YouTube. It's a very interesting series of um, experiments for Psych 101. I'm not having you do this, but uh, these two uh, students. She has a addiction to peanut butter Twix, and she can't stand anchovies or something like that, or escargot, whatever it is. I don't remember. And she was uh, uh, given; she's had to uh, eat them both together, and therefore she was winds up not being not wanting to eat the. Um, the peanut butter Twix anymore. That's called aversive conditioning. In other words, you pair your addiction or you or the thing that you're doing that you want to stop doing your habit with something uh, uh, that you that, that, that with with a, a disgusting 
or a negative, uh, biologically negative um, uh, uh, stimulus. This is done also with smoking in particular, you know. Uh, so the, in other words, somebody wants to stop smoking. If you smoke seven or eight or nine or 12 cigarettes at a time, you're going to get pretty darn sick. And that's going to stop that impulse to control. Now, the truth of the matter is this is really pretty... Um, uh, controversial. It might not be so effective, um, particularly because um, with the smoking, there is a physical addiction with it. With other ones, it's actually a lot better. With other uh, types of, of uh, things, I suppose, with the, with a, if it was a peanut butter Twix, it probably much better. Operant conditioning. Now, we talked about operant conditioning also. The other ones were more classical conditioning. Operant conditioning are those uh, things done by, uh, by Skinner, where we're talking about um, uh, reinforcements, uh, and this is used uh, uh, extensively in schools and in, in institutions, uh, reward charts. Uh, this young guy has uh, completed his reward chart and he's going to get some sort of reward or some sort of punishment if it's well structured. This particular picture doesn't look like it's well structured. It's some lady talking. But the point being that if it can be reinforced or sometimes behavior which is not reinforced and you st uh, make a point of ignoring a particular behavior, then it can become extinguished according to the rules of um, operant conditioning. Uh, on sometimes on a, a complete on a on a organizational institutional level, we talk about a token economy. Token economies are uh, used in, uh, um, in particularly in um, sometimes in camps or in uh, psychiatric um, uh, units where you get tokens for the for be, for behavior which has to be learned then these tokens can be used to purchase things in the in the canteen in the store or whatever it is the special places where they can use these particular tokens and always they are sort of like getting money for it um is this has been used uh in a um uh particularly in 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 uh wonderful uh, place called um, Boys and Girls Town in Omaha, Nebraska. Try to look that one up on the on, on, on uh, Google that. Uh, and you'll see how that they're uh, using this token economy to take children, adolescents who have been convicted of, of uh, nasty crimes uh, and put them there. And they because there was such a well-structured token economy, there's a particularly safe, a particularly safe place, a place where people actually turn out to change their whole lives around. Um, but the tokens then are used to produce to to, to um, purchase uh, uh, things when they start getting a uh, uh, in the in the boys and girls town if they're, when they're doing the homework and where when they're eating properly when they got when they uh, clean up when they do whatever they have to do within the the, the 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 course of their normal everyday lives it's this is done using the ideas of shaping which is successful approximation um, shaping the clients are told uh, taught to do something better but it's it has to be tailored specifically for the needs of a particular individual in other words it can't be just a willy-nilly for a, any particular situation uh, or across the board for everybody gets the same thing they, they get the tokens for where they are in their particular in other words in, for instance in a psychiatric hospital where um some people might get tokens for uh, getting up in the morning and, brought, and and washing their face, and some others will uh, will only get it when they when they make their beds, uh, or for uh, going to going to groups, etc. Uh, similarly, the same type of thing is in in a uh, in the uh, in a school where each child would get his tokens for. Uh, and it, it, uh, for, for the behavior which is in his particular plan. And of course, the goal is to be a completely functioning, and, uh, uh, and, but it goes closer and closer to what the, uh, goal, the final goal is. Okay, this is used also in social skills training, um, and there's some sort of monitoring, there's coaching, again, modeling, all these things are important uh, aspects in the behavioral therapy. Okay, now we're going to go on to cognitive therapies. Remember the name word cognitive. Cognitive means cognition, is, is, has to do with the word cognition, which means thinking. And these are therapies which focus on thought processes and changing thought processes. So the beliefs and attitudes, right, or 
ways that we think without thinking. If you, in other words, the thoughts that come into our minds without our uh, control of them, and auto, which we call automatic types of thinking, and they create and may, or compound or complicate clients' problems. If you're worried and you worry about your being worried, or you think about worried and you ruminate, it's going to make things worse. And maybe we can control that by cognitive therapy. That's the idea of cognitive therapy. It gives you insight into your current cognitions. In other words, it's not that uh, uh, psychodynamic insight of how it connects to the past, but rather it's more metacognition. It gives you the ability to think about how your thoughts are affecting you. And that's the realization that you're supposed to come, come to, right? You appraise what happens normally is that we take unfortunate events and we think about them in a way that makes us more uncomfortable. And being more uncomfortable makes it more difficult for us to cope with whatever it is we're trying to cope with. So this was uh, the um, uh, Aaron Beck was the father of the cognitive therapies. He has worked mostly with um, depression. Uh, and this cognitive therapy was for depression, was basically for depression because he said that the depression comes from thinking negative thoughts. And it's so much easier so much easier to control our thoughts and our emotions. Emotions move so quickly, they're fluid, they run them here, that, the other way, you can't sort of get hold of them. But he says, you know what, but you can control your thoughts a lot easier. So that's what the whole idea of the Aaron Beck was talking. He said you get some thoughts like, nobody likes me, right? Nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I'm gonna... Well, anyway, so if you... It's a kid came to me once, a six-year-old, he says, nobody likes me, nobody ever plays with me, right? Is this really true? Is there evidence of that? Not necessarily. You actually can find that, you know what, last week you had a friend, right? Oh, but that was last week. But it's even a six-year-old will find that there's that, that, that their negative thoughts, if you look carefully enough, you'll see that it's not necessarily true. So the idea is that we try to teach our clients to become personal scientists. In other words, to be skeptical, to question your own thoughts and beliefs. right, And see if there's actual empirical evidence, evidence which is based in objective reality to what we feel or we think. And that's the, the goal of the, of the cognitive therapy, right? Then, because when we think the wrong way, our problems in thinking, our errors in thinking, our cognitive errors, it makes our misery worse because we only see what we want to see. We think what we, what we think, we don't look at the whole picture, right? Our thoughts are telling us all sorts of garbage, Right, and we start thinking of believing some of these automatic thoughts. Right, what's like for instance, we overgeneralize. I got an F on that F test, F and test. Right, wow, that's I'm terrible. I'll never get by with anything. I'm always failing. I says, is it really true? Do you always? Usually, it's not true. And even if it was, right, we magnify things. It's the end of the world. It's I got this haircut. Nobody's going to want to go out with me. It's worse than I've ever thought before. I didn't think I was going to get like, so, so what's a terrible situation? How am I going to deal with it? No, it's not quite that bad. If you look at it objectively, you'll find that it's not really as bad as you thought it was. Or we think of absolutist thinking. It's going to be, this is has to, has to happen. It really must. It's, it, and it overpowers us. It, it, if you start thinking in that direction, it builds up one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. And it becomes absolutely impossible to live with such a situation. That, I mean, that's basically what happens. And we have to, if, we, if you get a hold of your thoughts, you get a hold of your cognitions, you try to measure it in an objective manner, you'll find that nothing is quite as bad as you really think it is. It's never that way. Because the objective real world is, the empirical world is not that, right? This is the idea. Um, and one of the most successful types of cognitive therapies is that of rational emotive behavior therapy. Um, this was a... Uh, uh, the uh, development of Albert Ellis, um, a very uh, charismatic sort of guy. You know, he used and he used very strange language, also, which we'll see. Um, but he focused on the beliefs about events as well as the events themselves. In other words, what we believed actually was what was our belief concerning that particular event. How is it? What do we think about it? Right. When, for instance, 
we can, if we have these irrational beliefs, and one of the most common irrational beliefs is that stress is what kills you. And okay, so there's, there's some evidence to that, but actually that's not the evidence is not really true. It's the belief that stress will kill you that kills you. If you believe that stress is a challenge, if you believe that stress is something which is, is, is something which you have to meet, it doesn't harm you. It actually makes you stronger. The irrational belief that stress is something that's going to make our, our lives impossible, that's not necessarily true, okay? We, we th- or we have that irrational we must have the love and approval of people who are important to us. If they don't love us, then we're not worthy. That's, is that really true? Is that, do, if the, somebody who is important to us doesn't love you, is that the end of the world? Maybe not. Or that we have to be absolutely competent, adequate in achieving, because if not, we're a failure. If we don't get past this psychology course, nothing, it's, I'm, I'm a failure. I can never get further. Well, is that really true? Right, and when he did this, or when this type of therapy is very, very, very directive and active. In other words, the therapist uh, tells the uh, the client what he has to do, tells the client to do this active activity or that activity. It's something that he, he actually t- guides people in the way of. This uh, ration of emotion, uh, emotive behavior therapy. He suggested we need less misery, less blaming, and more action. Um, and here is actually some of the uh, uh, directives and uh, uh, that Ellis would tell and give to his patients. Here's some of the things. Like for instance, it says number one: your parents are crazy. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean there. Uh, have to be hospitalized, but it means that you should forget e- virtually every nutty and often contradictory thing they, thing they ever told you, because no parents are perfect, and we think things and things, like that. and if that's true, right, so number two, you're driving yourself nuts, right, no one else's, especially your parents, in other words, if you're going crazy, if you're neurotic, it's not because of your parents, it's your own, your own responsibility, and especially, so no one else is, especially your parents, if you're an adult, and you accept one above, right? Number three, you can masturbate all you want, but things are the way are. Now, don't look that up in Google because Google is not very good at spelling. What does that mean? Go down to the small print, right, where people have healthy, often strong desires, goals, and values that they raise to absolutistic musts, shoulds, demands, and necessities. Right? So they say to themselves like this, because I strongly want to be achieving and winning significant others approving, I absolutely must keep fulfilling these goals. That's the way people think, and that's not really healthy. Or you might think like this, because I greatly prefer that people and conditions treat me considerably and fairly, I absolutely must do so. But that's not absolutely true. Okay, And then... Number four, you can awfulize, another term of Ellis. Uh, you can awfulize, but in the end, it is what it is, and no amount of hand-wringing will help. So what does that mean? So look at the, at the um, small print again. People see certain events as bad or as unfortunate for achieving their goals, and therefore healthfully try to change them and make themselves somewhat happy in spite of them. However... Right? But they are frequently viewed, they, they also frequently viewed these happenings as awful and terrible and therefore get much more frustrating and painful feelings. In other words, they make them feel, they, they view them as more awful than they really are. So when they awfulize, and it was making them more awful, they tend to view frustrating condi- conditions as totally bad, as bad as they could possibly be, and sometimes as more than bad. So what do they say to themselves? They say like this, this unfortunate condition for instance, not getting something that I want, is completely bad, is the end of the world, is totally devastating, is the worst possible thing that can happen, and it makes my life totally devoid of all possible pleasure. And it's called awfulizing. And when you awfulize, it ain't going to change much. And so therefore, it's not really very useful. So um, these are the ideas that uh, uh, Ellis would have you... Um, Put into your mind and live with them, and never do those uh, 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 of 
never follow these negative types of thoughts, but rather be on the positive side. Okay, moving right along, we're actually going to something which we started off with is the biological therapies, right? In other words, we were talking now until now until uh, the, uh, to, about the uh, um, talk cure. But there's also the biological. We talk about the biopsychosocial. Now we're talking about the biological. When we talk about biological, we're talking about something which we change the structures, the bodily structures, in order to help psychological disorders. Basically, this is mostly with severe, but also, uh, uh, but, uh, but also minor, relatively minor uh, things. And anything you go to a doctor and you get medicine, basically, or other possibilities, which we're actually going to only talk, mention one here, or maybe two, we'll see. And basically, we're talking about drug therapies. We're talking about some sort of chemical intervention in order to change um, and change the way the brain is working, right? Um, one class of drugs is of course the anti-anxiety drugs which include Ativan, Clonopin, Xanax, um, Lorazepam, uh, it's these sort of drugs. And the words actually Valium was one of the first ones back in the 1950s, right? That was actually before it became a controlled substance. It was sold as Mother's Little Helper. If you could recall, there was a Rolling Stones song about Mother's Little Helper, right? Then it was, this is actually the way it was sold. As a better living through chemistry, if you get too stressed out and too anxious, just take a little bit of Valium and you'll feel much better. It was happened to have been... Um, uh, marketed mostly to women, um, and uh, although it was, or there was some airlines who gave it out as you walked onto the airplane and you were and you're getting anxious, you got you got a packet of Valium to take before you got on the plane, um, and it's usually now prescribed for generalized anxiety or for panic attacks, right? Um, of course, you might get them if you're anxious about going to the uh, to for a root canal or some other or some minor surgeries. You also get that uh, you can get a Valium, and this is uh, you know they're not really marketed the way it used to be. Now it is a controlled substance because there's a lot of side effects, right? Which include sedation, which is the most common one, uh, but they're very addictive, and being very addictive, uh, when you stop then sometimes you get anxiety rebound. You actually get more anxious than you were from beforehand. So it's not a very use, a, a long t it cannot be used for long term, and uh, is, it can be very uh, devastating uh, physically. Um, let's see, the next one is the antipsychotic drugs for people who are experience psychosis. Uh, and these started off back in the 1950s. I mentioned this in the beginning of the, this lecture on the uh, previous tape, uh, the previous video, um, that the first antipsychotics were uh, developed in the 1950s, Thorazine, then Haldol, uh, very, very strong. But they were the first ones, and they were marketed really as quite, quite successful. Um, puts the end to his violent outbursts. Well, it was extremely sedating, uh, and it actually, um, if you recall from the chapter on um, psychopathology, there in, psych in schizophrenia there are uh, positive uh, symptoms and negative symptoms. Uh, positive symptoms are the delusions and the hallucinations uh, and the anxiety. The negative symptoms is the social uh, withdrawal and apathy. These only worked on the positive symptoms. And the typical antipsychotics, these first ones, are vi were extremely strong. They reduced, reduced agitation, delusions, hallucinations, very, you're pretty well, but you wound up with a, um, with, uh, a uh, very, very uh, sedated person. They work by blocking the dopamine receptors in the brain, only the dopamine receptors. Um, and they had a huge amount of, um, of side effects that people did not really want to stay on them at all, uh, which wasn't very good for the pharmaceutical companies or for the doctors because they wanted to keep that. It was not even good for the, um, you know, for the hospitals because they wanted people to stay uh, sedated. Um, 
So they came up with what we called, those were the, the typical antipsychotics, came with atypical, which basically um, they worked on the dopamine, but also serotonin receptors uh, in order to, and, and the differences between them I have here just as I practice serical, abilify, and risperdal, but there are a lot more uh, 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 antipsychotics um, on the market today. They're basically all the same, except that they have a slightly different chemical uh, um uh, compounds, chemical structures, and therefore they have slightly different, um, uh, 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 slightly different side effects. Some more and some less, uh, but they are still uh, very sedating. Um, they have their side effects can extreme extreme weight gain, sexual difficulties, uh, painful sex, for instance, tardive dyskinesia, which is um, as you see here in the pictures, it could be involuntary. Uh, the movement of the muscles of the face or the or the arms uh, or the eyes, etc. And sometimes the symptoms of, of even the hallucinations, delusions get worse and sometimes it, it increases the suicide risk. In effect, actually, what, it's, what, you, what you're seeing here is that some of these medications actually make the symptoms, what they're trying to treat, uh, treat worse than they were before. The other thing is, now, interestingly, they, until very recently, most psychiatrists, actually even now most psychiatrists, uh, will believe that you must stay on these for at least a year and sometimes even give a couple of them at a time. Now, the in, what is interesting though now is that, that the... Um, the head of the uh, National Institute of Mental Health, a government agency, as well as the head of the American Psychiatric Association, is saying that these uh, medications and all the psychiatric medications should be used as as little as possible for as short as time as possible, even though many, many psychiatrists still do not do that way. Um, other ones, for, for depressants. Let's talk about for a minute about the depressants. Now, here again, we have a... a, 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 a uh, a bunch of uh, sm a, a few of them, Wellbutrin, Paxil, Lexapro, Effexor, Zoloft. Uh, f um, uh, I don't know what that other fluoxetine. Um, there's there there are many different. Most of these antidepressants are SSRIs. Okay, they they are being used for all different types of. Uh, uh, possibilities. They're used for depression, but also for panic attacks, OCD, phobias. Um, actually, they've been used for things like like leg twitching. Uh, there's some, uh, uh, and so they're they've been used for many many different things. Nobody, by the way, really understands how any of these psychiatric medications actually work. A uh, very unusual. Uh, I mean, people do give them. Um, they uh, they what they do know that they increase the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, the earlier ones, the MAO, uh, the MAOs, the uh, 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 block the activity uh, of an enzyme that breaks down the noradrenaline and serotonin. Therefore, you will wind up with more adrenaline, more noradrenaline, and more serotonin. However, that's they're not used quite so much anymore. Um, the and the uh, the uh, second type is the tricyclic antidepressants, which prevents the reuptake of noradrenaline and serotonin, and the SSRIs block theirs. And that's the most popular one, the SSRIs, such as Prozac and Lexapro, etc. Um, now, it normally takes about two weeks to build up therapeutic levels. There's some sort of um, uh, uh, Things, a lot of things that we don't understand. One of the problems with a lot of these therapies, a lot of these drug therapies, is is the the um, the myth of a chemical imbalance. We know, for instance, that the neurotransmitters work differentially in different parts of the brain. Some places it'll do in in because each part of the brain is um, is uh, works. And functions for uh, for different functions in the body, and and different functions in thought, and different fun uh, functions in emotions. So, if one uh, uh, um, neurotransmitter is given throughout the whole brain, it will affect different parts of the brains differentially. So they won't necessarily actually do what they're supposed to be doing. Or they might be doing harm in another place and help in, a, in, in the place where they're going to. That's why we get these sometimes terrible um, side effects. Um, 
Okay, what else? We also have one of the most common, uh, commonly uh, uh, given uh, um, is lithium for bipolar and manic depression. Um, it modulates it modulates the, uh, the the moods because if you know in, in in bipolar disorder you have people getting very manicky, very oh they're, they're, their whole thought metabolism metabolism is running faster than the world actually works and they become elated so much so that they can wind up doing way terrible things or they and when that stops they become very very depressed lithium tends to modulate it tends to keep people somewhere in the in the middle um, they now say that Seroquel does the same thing, but uh, it what it also does, it actually flattens out all of the um, emotions. So you get very apathetic. You don't feel, um, you don't feel, ap- you don't feel up or down, um, and it uh, affects. Uh, more of the transmitters, including glutamate, and their side effects can, can be hair and tremors, dry mouth, uh, memory impairment, um, excessive thirst, and uh, excessive urination. So uh, it's really, they're not pleasant drugs at all. Um, again, I believe that it's probably, that I'm, I'm of the belief that they, it's given probably for too long for, to, the, for too uh, many things. Um, other therapies, the uh, other biological therapies, and this is the last one we're going to talk about, is the electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. Uh, now, this used to be extremely dangerous. They put very, and it's been vilified in the um, in the uh, movies and in the media, and rightfully so, because there have been a lot of people in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and maybe even the 80s who are really had their brains fried from this. Today, they use a very low amount, uh, and it's for, for, uh, for severe depression. It is helpful for some people. I don't particularly like the idea, but um, there are a lot of people who swear by it, uh, and you can actually find uh, diaries of people of who've gone through electroconvulsive therapy on the internet. Uh, but it's mostly for people with major depression who do not respond to antidepressants. What happens here is they put a uh, they they actually put a. Uh, uh, an electric current through the brain, either through one side of the brain or through both sides of the brains, and uh, and and the person actually convulses. He gets he 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 goes. He has a a seizure, and the seizure seems to mess up the brain a little bit, but might put it back on track a little bit. You there's there is um um uh, there is a, uh, a problems with memory afterwards. Uh, people can f- lose part of the memory. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, and it seems to work at least for a short period of time.